So in the last lecture, we began talking about the importance and centrality of the issue of personhood to the abortion debate. And as I argued, uh, there are a number of key rights that only and all persons have. And among these rights, uh, one of the most central rights is a right to life. We then tried to flesh out a little more in a little more detail what a right to life is. And as I said, probably the best definition is that it is a right not to be unjustly killed. However, this raised a number of important questions. What is a just reason to kill a person? And as I tried to argue, it seems like the only clear-cut justifications to kill another person are for reasons of defense of life, either defense of one's own life or defense of someone else's life. There are, some argu there are arguably some other reasons that might be justifiable uh, for taking a life, maybe uh, for reasons of capital punishment or for reasons of mercy killing, but those are fairly controversial. The uncontroversial justification uh, or justifications are going to be for some kind of defense of life. And there are going to be a number of different situations that might arise where you might wonder, well, is this defending life or is it not defending life? But we're not going to get into any of those kinds of fine-grained details. Uh, what I want to do today is continue part of our discussion from last class uh, of trying to emphasize and illustrate the importance of the issue of personhood to the abortion debate. And what I want to do in this lecture is walk through a number of key arguments both for and against abortion. Uh, because as it turns out, there are a lot of arguments that you'll hear people repeat in common discourse, uh, either in defense of abortion or uh, against abortion. And the truth is, is that a lot of these arguments are just really, really bad. And the reason they're bad is because they assume what it is they're trying to prove. Uh, when this occurs, when you assume what it is you're trying to prove, uh, then you engage in what is called begging the question. Uh, we beg questions against opponents. Uh, this is a, a term that I, I need to explain a little bit because you may have heard begging the question in other contexts. Sometimes when people say uh, that you're begging the question, what they mean is you're raising an interesting set of questions. For instance, you might look at some of the recent uh, shootings of civilians by police officers and say, well, these series of events, they beg the question, what is a justifiable use of lethal force by a police officer? And in that case, what you're doing is you're saying these actions raise an interesting question, raise an important question. But there's another sense of the word or the term beg the question, and that is to just, as I said a second ago, to assume what it is you're trying to prove. Uh, and what I find is that a lot of these arguments for and against abortion, uh, they're of the nature that uh, someone who, let's say, is pro-life, they're making the argument, yet they're assuming up front that the fetus is a person. It's implicit within the argument structure. And so then the conclusion that follows from that is one that someone who is pro-choice wouldn't be willing to accept because they're going to have rejected that implicit premise or that assumption that the fetus is uh, a person. And the converse is true. Sometimes people argue uh, that the fetus, uh, they try to argue that the abortion is permissible, but embedded within their argument is this implicit assumption that the fetus isn't a person, and so therefore it lacks a right to life. And so what I want to do is just walk through some of these uh, arguments and look at them and show why they would be unsuccessful. Remember, the point of a good argument is to convince someone who holds uh, an opposing viewpoint from your own. And in order to do that, you have to proceed on premises that they're willing to accept. If, if you start with a premise uh, that they're unwilling to accept, uh, then your argument is not going to be any good. Think about it like this. Suppose I was trying to uh, convince someone that God exists. And, and, and they were an atheist, and they didn't believe that God exists. And so I said, okay, well, look, I can prove to you God exists. It's in the Bible, and the Bible says that God exists. Uh, that shouldn't be a very convincing argument, because the person who's the atheist is going to say, well, I don't believe that the Bible is true. I don't believe that it's accurate. And then if you fired back and said, but it's the word of God, and God wouldn't lie. Hopefully you can see the circularity involved in that kind of argument. The person who's making the argument is assuming up front that the Bible uh, is authoritative, and they're assuming that it's authoritative because 
they assume God exists and the Bible was authored by God. Uh, but of course, these are all kinds of assumptions that the atheist you're making the argument with isn't going to accept. And so your argument is really not going to be very convincing. It's going to beg the question. Now, this is somewhat of a difficult exercise for students sometimes because uh, I think a lot of times they think that when we go over this, I'm trying to convince them of one position or the other. But that's not at all what's going on. What we're going to be doing at this point is engaging in a sort of hypothetical kind of reasoning. And I want you to look at things from the pro, we're going to start with looking at things from the pro-life side and try to weigh and balance these arguments, these arguments that are being made for abortion, and think, would someone who's pro-life find these things acceptable? Would someone who's pro-life be convinced by this kind of argument? Uh, and once we get done doing that, we're going to then turn and look at some pro-life arguments. And what I want you to do at that point is kind of put on your, your pro-choice thinking cap and think, would someone who is pro-choice find these arguments convincing? So hopefully you can see we're just engaging in this hypothetical reasoning. Would this argument be convincing to this opponent? Or would this other argument be convincing to a different opponent? And like I said, we're going to begin by looking at some common, what we're going to do is we're going to begin by looking at some common pro-choice arguments and asking the question, would someone who is pro-life find these arguments convincing? So you're going to have to put on your pro-life thinking cap, even if you're not pro-life. Just put on your pro-life thinking cap and, and reason through these arguments and think, if I was in this other person's position, would I find this argument convincing? Now to begin this exercise, what's going to be really important is that you can see the world from the point of view of someone who is pro-life. And someone who is pro-life sees the fetus uh, as a person. For them, the fetus is a person. And for that reason, the fetus therefore has a right to life. Uh, it has a right, in other words, not to be killed except for reasons of defense. Uh, and so uh, it's really, really important that you get in this frame of mind up front. I find that sometimes people who are uh, pro-choice have a little difficulty with, with doing this because they look at the fetus and they'll say, hey, but it's just a clump of cells, or hey, it's just this tiny little thing. Uh, and, and I think that's all, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit misleading or it's a little bit misunderstands what the pro-life person is saying. Because for them, the fetus is a person. And it's irrelevant that the fetus is any little bitty thing inside of a woman. For them, it's still a person. Um, and, and it doesn't matter that it's little. Little people don't have fewer rights than large people. Uh, Danny DeVito doesn't have fewer rights than Shaquille O'Neal. And so for someone who's pro-life, they're going to say, well, look, it's still a person. It doesn't matter that it's little bitty. And likewise, they're going to say, it doesn't matter that it's located inside of someone. Uh, you're a person no matter where you're located. If you're inside of another person or if you're outside of a person, uh, your personhood doesn't come and go dependent on your location. Now, I, I don't know. For me, I, I had a little trouble, I think, initially uh, understanding this. And so I want to share with you this uh, movie uh, trailer from this movie from a long time ago that probably few of you have ever seen. Uh, but we're going to watch this trailer because I think what it does is that it helps uh, show you kind of this idea that if you're a person, you're a person no matter what size you are or no matter where you're located. So let's see if I can get this to come up. Jack Putter. I'm in a man. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, 
I'm possessed. Now, Jack's got twice the problems. How you doing, Jack? But he's double the man. With Tuck on his side. We need more cows. In his gut. And on his case. You're not going to back groceries all your life, are you, Jack? And only 24 hours left for Jack to get out of danger. So that Tuck can get out of Jack. Dennis Quaid, Martin Short. This summer, give yourself a shot of adventure. Inner Space. So I know that was silly, but hopefully you get the idea that's being presented there that uh, if you're a person, you don't lose your personhood just because you get really, really small or shrunk down. Uh, just like in in the clip there, Jack Putter, he got, you know, shrunk down to, uh, or wait, no, Tuck got shrunk down and got injected into Jack. But he was still a, a person. It didn't matter how little he was. It didn't matter that he got injected inside of someone else. Uh, he'd still be a person. And I know this is a silly way of, of demonstrating the point here, but hopefully you can see the parallel uh, and you can understand where the person who is pro-life is coming from, even if you disagree with them. They think it's a person, the fetus is a person, and therefore it has a right uh, to life. Now with this in mind, let's turn to some of the common pro-choice arguments that you hear and ask, would someone who is pro-life find these kinds of arguments persuasive? So with this in mind, let's turn to one such argument. Uh, and this is a common pro-choice argument that you'll hear sometimes. Is People will argue something like, well, abortion is permissible because the fetus is just part of the woman's body. Now, keeping in mind that this argument is being made to someone who is pro-life, and they're trying to convince someone who is pro-life that abortion is morally permissible, I want you to stop and ask yourself, would someone who is pro-life find this argument persuasive? And I think the answer that you should come to and the conclusion you should reach is that the answer is no. Uh, someone who is pro-life is not going to be swayed by this kind of argument. Now, why is that? Well, because what they're going to say in response is just that the fetus isn't simply a part of the woman's body. Remember, for them, the fetus is a person. Uh, and if the fetus is a person, it wouldn't be a part. It's certainly not a part in the way that her lungs or kidneys are a part of her body. Uh, it's a separate entity that's living inside of her. Uh, what is more appropriate to say uh, is not that the fetus is a part of the woman's body, but that it is something that is attached to her body. But even if we specify this, even if we clarify this and say, hey, the fetus is, some, is something that's attached to a woman's body, does that automatically give you permission to end its life? And what someone who is pro-life is going to say is, no, it doesn't. Just because uh, one person is attached to your body, that doesn't give you permission to terminate their life. And, and we can look at an instance uh, to demonstrate this of conjoined twins. And you can say right here, say, well, look, this little girl right here is attached to this little girl right here. So because they're attached, does that give this little girl on the left permission to kill the little girl on the right? And I think the answer, again, should be obviously no. Just because you end up being attached to someone else doesn't give you permission automatically to end their life. Now, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you this. In a week or so, we're going to look at an argument that does address this particular uh, concern right here that's being raised and does flesh out a more convincing way of demonstrating, I think, maybe what the intuition that lies behind this. But what I want you to see at the present moment is just this, is that this argument up here, the fetus is just attached, uh, I'm sorry, the fetus is just a part of a woman's body, that's not a good basis as it stands for defending uh, pro, a pro-choice position. Why? Because someone who's pro-life is going to automatically just reject that claim. They're going to say, no, the fetus isn't a part of the woman's body. The fetus is a separate, living, breathing um, person. Uh, and so since it's a person, it has a right to life. So 
And that's the first thing I want to point out here, the first argument we want to address. This is a common pro-choice argument. You'll hear people say, well, the fetus is just a part of the woman's body. And, and maybe that's true, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but, the, but the salient, the important point is that uh, this isn't going to be something that convinces your, your target audience, who are people who are pro-life. Uh, another argument that you'll hear, and this is an argument more for, I guess, the legality of abortions, is that uh, sometimes people will say, well, abortion should be legal because women are going to have them anyway. And again, if you're making this argument to someone who's pro-life, it's going to be extremely unpersuasive. Why is that? Well, because they're going to view the fetus as a person. And if the fetus is a person, then it has a right to life. And in effect, what they're going to hear when you say this is that you should legalize murder because people are going to be committing it anyway. And, and that's just not a convincing line of argument. Uh, certainly, we wouldn't legalize murder uh, for uh, adults because they're going to be murders committed anyway. Uh, and we could say something very, very similar for the fetus. Remember, for someone who's pro-life, it's a person, so it has a right to life. Uh, and so what you're saying, if you press this argument, say, well, people are going to do it anyway, so it should be legal, you're basically saying that, that we should legalize murder because people are going to commit them anyway. But that's just a horrible line of argumentation. Uh, and... Again, I'm not, in going over these, these pro-choice arguments, trying to say that the pro-choice position is necessarily wrong. What I'm trying to do is to demonstrate that some of these arguments, they're not good because they're not going to have any kind of convincing power for their intended audience. They're, these kinds of arguments are trying to convince people who are pro-life. They're not going to do that. Uh, and that's because someone who's pro-life is starting with a different assu assumption, namely that the fetus is a person. Here's, here's another argument that is sometimes offered is that uh, for a pro-choice position. And sometimes people say, well, it's better for a woman to have an abortion than to have an unwanted child. Uh, and we might even say, well, look, you know, isn't it better for a child uh, just to be, or for a fetus to be aborted than to grow up in a, a family where they're not loved, where they're not treated well, um, where they're not given a adequate attention? And you have to stop and think about this for a second. If the fetus is a person, which someone who is pro-life believes, is this a convincing argument? And what they're going to say is no. Um, it's not permissible to kill a person merely because they're unwanted. If this was a, a sound argument, then basically you could justify kill, killing anyone who's unwanted. Uh, you could go into a nursing home. For instance, there are a lot of nursing homes where no one ever comes to visit the elderly. There are a lot of nursing homes where no one uh, you know, has any relatives, no one has any friends. They just sit in rooms by themselves. And to a large extent, those people are, and as cruel as this sounds, but they're unwanted in some way or another. But surely it would be immoral to go in and, and kill people in nursing homes. Or there are many children uh, who their parents don't want them. They're born and their parents don't want them. The, are we justified in killing them? Certainly not. Uh, you, you're not allowed. It's immoral. It's, un, it's not legal to kill someone because they're not wanted. Well, if a fetus is a person then you cannot justify killing them just because they are unwanted or they may be unwanted. That's not a sound justification. And so, again, this argument, it's only going to work to the extent that you assume up front that the fetus isn't a person. But if you're operating with a different starting assumption, namely that it is a person, this is just not a convincing line of argumentation at all. And, and we're going to go through a couple more of these, but hopefully you're seeing a trend emerge here about how important the issue of personhood is. Because so far, these three arguments, all of them fail. All of them fail because they assume up front uh, that the fetus isn't a person. But if you, was, if you make the opposite assumption that it is, these arguments fall by the wayside. They're not convincing at all. I'm going to look at another argument here. Uh, probably one of the most often cited reasons 
uh, that women have abortion is that they discovered that the child has a physical or mental deformity. Uh, you, you actually see that a lot of abortions are performed because women learn that their children have Down syndrome. And so for that reason, they decide, well, I'd, I'd just prefer to have an abortion than to bring a child into the world with such a deformity. But we have to ask, is this a sound reason for having an abortion? And the answer to that is going to turn to some ex or going to turn largely on uh, whether or not the fetus is in fact a person. And let's assume up front that the fetus is a person. If it is a person, then this does not justify an abortion. And, and think about it like this. Uh, imagine someone who's 20 years old who has Down syndrome. Uh, would it be morally permissible to kill them? And the answer should be obviously no. You can't go up and kill them and say, hey, you have Down syndrome, your life's not worth living, so we're going to kill you because it's better for you not to live. Uh, that would be just a horrible, horrible thing to do. And you might say, yeah, but you know, if you bring them into the world, they're going to have all this agony and pain. You know, to be fair, that's not entirely true. There are many people with Down syndrome who lead perfectly healthy lives. Uh, and, and I do know that sometimes you do have cases where uh, people are born with Down syndrome and it is somewhat of a burden to their family, uh, and in some cases even a large burden, but that doesn't justify killing someone who has Down syndrome. Uh, if they're a person, they're a person regardless of their mental deformity. Uh, and so what someone who, uh, who begins with a pro-life position is going to say is they're going to say, look, they're a person. The fact that they have Down syndrome doesn't negate their personhood. And we certainly wouldn't be allowed to kill uh, a 10-year-old who had Down syndrome or a 20-year-old or a one-day-old. Uh, the only way that you can justify killing or terminating a pregnancy when you discover that uh, the fetus has Down syndrome, the only way you can do that is if you assume that that fetus isn't a person. But of course, someone who's pro-life, they're starting with the opposite assumption, that the fetus is a person. So here again, even this argument, it only works to the extent that you can demonstrate that the fetus isn't a person. Because if it is a person, despite the fact that it has a mental deformity or physical deformity, if it's a person, it still has a right to life. So yet again, this argument, it doesn't demonstrate uh, that the fetus isn't a person. It doesn't demonstrate that abortion is permissible. It, it hinges on this critical starting assumption. Is the fetus a person? Yes or no? Well, we've looked at some, some common pro-choice arguments. Uh, I want to look at just a couple more uh, because some of the, and these really, I don't know if I'm calling these pro-choice arguments, but the truth is, is, is these are arguments for, uh, or justifications. The next two I'm going to look at are arguments uh, for justifying abortion. Now, not everybody who advances uh, this argument or the next one necessarily identifies as pro-choice. In fact, sometimes you'll see people who are pro-life advance this very argument right here. Uh, they'll say that um, uh, in cases of rape, um, the pain and suffering that a woman uh, experiences uh, is unfair. It's an unfair burden on the woman, and therefore she should be allowed to have an abortion. Now, what I want to do is look at this, because when you look at surveys, when you look at Gallup polls, I think that uh, this is the kind of justification for abortion that probably somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of the population agrees upon. They say if a woman has been raped and as a result of that rape becomes pregnant, then it's morally permissible to have an abortion. I want to call this into question, not because I, I, it's necessarily reflective of my own view, but I want to demonstrate to you uh, the importance, yet again, of this starting assumption of it, the fetus being a person. And many people reject this argument. I say many, or some people reject this argument. Uh, and some people argue that even in cases where a woman has become pregnant uh, as a result of uh, a rape, abortion would not be permissible in that case. And the reason that they come to that conclusion is because they view the fetus as a person. Now, I don't know if any of you know who Paul Ryan is, but he uh, is the current uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, he uh, was Mitt Romney's 
a running mate in the last election. He was almost vice president of the United States. And he holds what I call a strong conservative position. Uh, you may recall that I'd said that there are a gradation of different conservative views. Likewise, there are a gradation of different liberal views when it comes to abortion. The extreme position says that uh, abortion is never permissible no matter what. The extreme conservative position. What I'm calling the strong conservative position says that abortion is only permissible when the, when the pregnancy threatens the mother's life. Uh, but the strong conservative position would say that abortion is impermissible uh, in cases of rape or incest. Now, this sounds like a really horrible kind of view to a lot of people's ears, but I want you to understand it. Even if you don't agree with, you, uh, agree with it, I want you to understand it and see why this position uh, is, is endorsed by some people. And the truth is, is I think what you're going to find is that even though it might seem really counterintuitive at a first pass, it's actually internally consistent with the logic of uh, the view. And what Paul Ryan and others like him say is just this, is they say, look, the fetus is a person and the fetus has a right to life. And it doesn't lose that right to life just because it exists as a product of rape. Uh, it's not permissible to kill somebody else. It's not permissible to take an innocent life uh, because something bad was done to the mother. And some of you might still not be convinced by the logic here. So I want you to just uh, work with me a, a little bit and uh, think about this uh, kind of parallel to what's going on. Uh, so there was, uh, there was this case of a student at a university in the state of Oregon, and the student uh, was accused of rape. It was a male student. He was accused of rape by uh, another student. Now, as it turns out, uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't the girl's rapist. Uh, in fact, uh, she had been raped uh, the previous summer, uh, and she lived in a city that was a thousand miles away from, from where this uh, st male student lived. Uh, but here's the thing. He looked like her rapist. He looked like her rapist. And for that reason, that he looked like her rapist, and that every time she saw him, she relived the instance, or the incident, uh, the, tar the terrible incident that uh, that occurred to her, uh, he was banned at the university from attending any social function that she would be uh, present at. So any kind of school-sponsored social function that she would be at, he was no longer allowed to attend. Why? Just because he looked like her rapist. Now I want you to ask, is that something that's fair? Is it fair to punish one person for the actions of somebody else? And that seems completely wrong. I think everybody would agree. But that seems very much parallel to what's going on in this case at hand. Is it permissible to kill the fetus for the actions of somebody else? Is it permissible to take an innocent life because of something that some other bastard did? And, and that doesn't seem right. Uh, again, in this case, you're punishing the fetus for the actions of the rapist. And it is, I have to, uh, and look, I don't know, this isn't my own view. I'm trying to help you understand where someone like Paul Ryan is coming from so you can see the logic of their argument. But basically what's going on is this, is someone like Ryan, he begins, someone like the strong conservative, they begin with the position that the fetus is a person. It has a right to life. So you can only kill it in cases of defense. Well, uh, you know, you're, or maybe cases of punishment, but you're basically killing the fetus for somebody else's wrongdoing. And they're going to say that's just, that's not a sound principle. That's not a principle we would apply at any other facet of life. And so for this reason, abortion would be impermissible even in cases of rape. And again, the driving assumption to all of this is just that the fetus is a person, and so it has a right to life. Now, again, you might not agree with this, but I hope you can understand where uh, someone like Ryan is coming from. You hope you can understand where someone like the strong conservative is coming from. Finally, I want to look at this uh, particular justification for uh, abortion and Again, this is a justification. I have it listed as a common pro-choice argument, but the truth is, is this is something that 
I think nearly 90% of the population agrees upon, even people who are pro-life. Uh, even someone like Paul Ryan would say that abortion is permissible when it threatens the life of the mother. And typically this is regarded as a case of self-defense. As we've said, if you have a right to life, uh, then you... Uh, you, that right basically it enables you or grants you the um, the right not to be killed except in cases of defense. So if the fetus is threatening the mother's life, you know she's just defending herself, and so abortion would be justifiable in that case. Well, there are some people who reject this, uh, and some people argue that even in cases where the fetus threatens the mother's life abortion would be immoral and it would not be permissible for her to have one. And here I have a summary. This is from Pope Pius XI, and he adopts what I've uh, dubbed the extreme conservative position. And this is what he says. He says, However much we may pity the mother whose health and even life is gravely imperiled in the performance of the duty allotted to her by nature, Nevertheless, what could ever be a sufficient reason for excusing in any way the direct murder of the innocent? This is precisely what we are dealing with here. And notice the, the line I have underlined up here. He says, even if her life is gravely imperiled in the performance of the duty allotted to her by nature. And what he's saying is just that even if her life is threatened, abortion would still be impermissible, even if she has to die. Uh, as a result of the pregnancy, uh, even if both the mother and the fetus have to die as a result of the pregnancy, it would be wrong to terminate the pregnancy. And for some of you, you might think, that's just barbaric, that's insane, how could someone ever come to such a view? And I'm actually going to try to show you how this view is not as insane as you might think it is, that there's actually some logic um, behind it. And uh, what I want to do is call into question the key premise in the, the previous argument that we looked at, which is that uh, this is just an act of self, that abortion where uh, the pregnancy threatens the life of the mother is an act of self-defense. Because I'm not so certain that it is obviously an act of self-defense. Uh, I know some of you are probably like rolling your eyes right now when I just said that, but I want you to think about what constitutes a legitimate act of self-defense. Uh, and this is what we're going to be looking at right here. Uh, when do, do you always have a right to kill someone who is threatening your life? Because uh, what is an act of self-defense? Well, you kill someone who's threatening your life. Uh, but do you always have a right to kill someone who's threatening your life? And you might think, well, yeah, obviously, you always have a right to... If someone's threatening your life, you know, it's either me or them, and I have a right to kill them. But not so fast. Not so fast. A lot depends on the circumstances that led them to the point where they're threatening your life. A lot depends on the circumstances that, that create the situation where they're threatening your life. So let me give you a thought experiment here. Uh, suppose that I have this drug. I know this picture is terrifying here, but suppose I have this drug, uh, and if I give it to you, it'll turn you into a homicidal maniac. You'll just go on a killing rampage, and you'll, you'll murder anybody in your sight. And I slip you this drug, and then I'm the only one present around you. I slip you the drug, you turn into this homicidal maniac, and you come after me with a knife. Um, in that case, you're, you're trying to kill me. But do I have a right to kill you and call it self-defense? Would that be a legitimate case of self-defense in that particular situation? I slipped you the drug, you're trying to kill me, and then I kill you um, to prevent you from killing me. It seems hard to call that a legitimate case of self-defense. Why? Because I'm the one who initiated the causal sequence which led to you threatening my life. Uh, had I not slipped you the pill to, to turn you into a homicidal maniac, you never would have tried to kill me. So I'm the one that puts you and myself in that situation. I'm the one that bears causal responsibility and therefore moral responsibility for creating the entire situation to begin with. And now you might be thinking, well, how in the world is this relevant to what's going on um, with the case at hand when we're talking about abortion? Um, and, and it's just like this. Look, 
if a woman gets pregnant, uh, and let's say it's through an, a consensual act, uh, and then that pregnancy threatens her life, well, certainly you, would, you wouldn't typically say the woman is morally responsible for this. Uh, but then again, neither is the fetus. The fetus didn't act to be asked to be put in that situation. The fetus didn't ask. The fetus didn't say, "Hey, I want to try to kill my mom." Uh, it didn't ask for that at all. And so, what we have here is we have, to some extent, we have two innocent lives. The mother's mother is innocent. She hasn't done anything immoral. The fetus is also innocent and hasn't done anything immoral. But the question is, if we have to choose between one life or the other, in this particular case. Who bears more causal responsibility for creating the entire situation? The fetus or the mother? And if we assume that the mother in, became pregnant through her own free will and consent, then the mother actually bears more causal responsibility for creating the situation uh, than the fetus does. And so by that measure, this wouldn't be a pure act of self-defense for the very reason that in the previous thought experiment uh, that I provided you wasn't a pure act of self-defense. Why is that? Because you have to consider who bears more causal responsibility. Uh, justifiable self-defense requires that the person defending themselves is not to blame for the situation to begin with. And I know it sounds horrible to say that a mother whose life is threatened by pregnancy, that she's to blame, and, and I, I wouldn't want to couch it in just that language, but she did initiate the causal sequence. She bears some responsibility to that extent for creating her, the situation which is threatening her life and the fetus's life. However, the fetus, by comparison, bears none. The fetus made no uh, deliberate act to put them in that kind of situation whatsoever. And so, again, if you're having to choose between, well, whose life do you save in this situation, uh, it seems like you can make an argument that you pick the one who's totally innocent, the one who didn't uh, have any kind of causal input whatsoever uh, in creating the situation. Now, you might disagree with this, and you might find some arguments and some ways to poke holes at this, and that's perfectly fine. All I'm trying to do is to get you to understand where uh, this kind of extreme conservative position is coming from. And I've never experienced this firsthand, but I've been told by a number of people that this is uh, something that is widely endorsed, and, and actually, uh, you see it... Um, exemplified in Catholic hospitals. I've been told by a number of people who've worked in Catholic hospitals or who've had children in Catholic hospitals that um, if a child, if a, if a, let's say a pregnancy is threatening the mother's life, that the doctors at that hospital, they'll save the fetus first and then come back and save the mother later. And the reason for that is I mean, I can't say exactly what it is in every case, but it's going to be something like the reason I've just outlined. They view the fetus as complete as a person. They start with that assumption. The fetus is a person and has a right to life. The mother is a person, and the mother has a right to life. But who is, you might say, more innocent? Who is the most innocent in this particular case, where the, in, in a case involving the fetus threatening the mother's life? And they're going to say the fetus. And so, therefore, they'll save the fetus, before they try to go back and save the mother. So hopefully you can see these arguments, and hopefully you can see where these extreme positions come from. What I've done so far is I've basically walked through uh, a couple of arguments and shown how the first four I walked through, I, sh I was trying to show you how these arguments wouldn't be convincing to someone who is pro-life. Why? Because they begin with the starting assumption that the fetus is a person. And the arguments that we saw with one through four they have to assume or smuggle in in some kind of implicit way that the fetus isn't a person. And then what I tried to show you in the last two arguments was how this assumption about personhood, if you begin with the, this idea that the fetus is a person, it's actually, it can lead you in a way that's not as crazy as it may first appear to adopt either the strong conservative position or this extreme conservative position. Uh, so what we're going to do in the next video lecture is we're going to start looking at uh, some arguments that are common pro-life arguments and we're going to start uh, evaluating those and seeing how those wouldn't be convincing to someone who begins with the alternate 
starting assumption. That being, the fetus isn't a person. 